Good afternoon, welcome back uh, to the Naval Academy Museum to the Shaikul Lecture Series. This lecture series is funded by the Class of 1950 Museum Endowment in recognition of the significant contribution made to the endowment by the Shaikul Trust. Vice Admiral Ralph Shaikul was a highly decorated naval aviator, a graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy, Class of 1933. He participated in World War II operations against the Japanese at New Guinea, Saipan, Guam, the Palaos, and the Philippines. He was awarded the Navy Cross and Distinguished Flying Cross. Our guest today is Dr. Larry Ferrero, who's an adjunct lecturer at the Catholic University of America in Systems Engineering. He's a professor of Systems Engineering and Science and Technology Management at Defense Acquisition University. He's been a liaison scientist with the Office of Naval Research in London, a risk systems engineer with the U.S. Coast Guard, and a naval architect with the U.S. Navy. He's the author of Ships and Science, The Birth of Naval Architecture in the Scientific Revolution, 1600 to 1800, and currently Measure of the Earth, the Enlightenment Expedition that Reshaped Our World. So thanks, Larry. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, hello, thanks for coming. Um, we're gonna, uh, today I'm going to be talking about my book, uh, Measure of the Earth. Uh, first, uh, I have to say that no, it's not in the bookstore downstairs, but it is available on Amazon. I didn't bring any copies with me. Um, the reason I'm talking about this here at the Naval Academy is even though it's a, uh, it's a story of a scientific expedition to the equator uh, during the Age of Enlightenment, uh, the 18th century, this is all about naval power, pure and simple. That's the reason why I'm here. Because as I will be saying several times during this lecture, um, in that age as today, science is really the continuation of politics by other means, just as war is the continuation of politics by other means. Why am I saying that? Well, we had a scientific problem in the Age of Enlightenment that was directly related to a strategic problem. Uh, at the dawn of the scientific revolution, we had a couple of competing theories of the shape of the Earth. In the 1600s, a man named Rene Descartes had come up with this grand theory of everything, that the entire universe was created with vortices that swirled uh, all around, moved the planets, moved the stars. And one of the things that came out of that theory was that somehow that caused the Earth to be squished in at the middle, elongated at the poles, kind of egg-shaped. That was the prevailing theory for a while until this upstart mathematician in a remote corner of Britain named Isaac Newton came up with this different idea that these vortices were not the, um, the, the cause for the planets and the stars to move. Um, in fact, it was this odd thing, and he couldn't even describe what it was, called the traction, what we call today gravity. And gravity was what held the moon in its orbit, caused objects to fall, and caused the stars and planets to move in their orbits. Now, by Newton's calculations, uh, gravity, and most specifically the spinning of the Earth, which causes a centrifugal force, as we've all learned now, um, caused the Earth not to be squished and elongated at the poles, but rather squashed at the poles and, elong and, and widened at the equator. So the question was, which theory was correct? Now, the, this sounds like an obscure scientific debate, and in many respects it was, except that it had become imbued with both strategic and political importance. And part of the reason was the obvious. At the time, the two superpowers were Britain and France. Now, again, let's keep in mind the age we're talking about, about 1700s. Um, Descartes was, of course, French, and on the French side of the channel, his theories uh, were, were prevailed, whereas in Britain they accepted Newton's theories almost without question. But it was more than just this political rivalry between two superpowers. It was really the question of who would be able to define the shape of the Earth and therefore be able to navigate to control empires, because that's what the real power struggle between these two nations was. Who will control the global empires? And science became a major part of that battle. If they were not able to determine whether the Earth was elongated or flattened at the poles, you would not be able to traverse the oceans for hundreds of miles. So science, as I said, like war, became the extension of politics by other means. Now, if this sounds a little bit like 
the contest between the Soviet Union and the United States during the Cold War and the deployment of science, read the Apollo program, for example, as a means of fighting that war by proxy, you have some idea of what was going on. Well, the French Navy took this on as one of their responsibilities. In fact, um, you probably have, uh, because you're at this lecture, um, you probably have all heard of, or if you have not, I'll tell you, um, a, of a wonderful book called Longitude by Davis Sobel, who, by the way, is a wonderful author. I encourage you to get that book after you get mine. <laughs> um, and the, the question of uh, how to calculate longitude at sea had the same strategic importance. In today's dollars, navies were spending literally billions of, of then year pounds, um, leave, etc., to answer the questions of how to navigate on the oceans. And it was all related to being able to control empire over long distances. Well, the equator was the site uh, for determining what the true shape of the Earth was. And the reason is that when you're actually on the globe, you can't see what the shape is. But you can make measurements around the globe to help you determine that. And this is the way it's done. Um, Two new words for your vocabulary, prolate spheroid, oblate spheroid. Egg, grapefruit. How's that? Um, if you are, we are at about, I think it's about 39 degrees north latitude, more or less. Um, and I don't know which way north is in here. But if you go about 62 miles, I think it is, north, um, you'll be at 40 degrees north latitude. And if the Earth was a perfect sphere, that distance, 60 69 miles? I, I, forgot, I already forgot the day. 69 miles would be the same no matter where you are on the globe. But if the arc of the Earth actually changes, in other words, if it was an ellipse, that distance would change depending upon whether you were at the equator or further north. So if the Earth, as we now know today, was uh, oblate, the length of a degree of latitude at the equator would be somewhat shorter than the length a little bit further north. Now, in France, they'd already been doing surveys for some years, and they determined what the length of a degree of latitude was at the uh, latitude of Paris, which was about 45 degrees north. So the question was, could we send an expedition halfway around the world to the equator, take another measurement there, compare it with what we already knew up in France, and thereby determine whether uh, the Earth was oblate or prolate? Now, for the French, by the way, this was a win-win, um, in part because if it showed that the Earth was shaped like Descartes had suggested, their science was better. But if, in fact, they found it to be what Newton had described, essentially they would have co-opted Newton for their own. They would have proven um, his theories are correct even before the British did. So for the French and the French Navy, this was win-win scientifically as a publicity um, event, uh, politically, and as I said, strategically. So the question was, how do we form an expedition to go to the equator to make these measurements? Now, this was uh, an unusual task because before this time, most science had been done by individuals, by individual countries, sort of one person shows. And at the time, of course, one man shows. This was different. This was science on a global scale, on an international scale. It had never been done before. First, Peru, which was the name of the colony of Spain at the time, um, and I'll say why we don't use the word Ecuador just yet, um, was of course owned by Spain. So France had to go to Spain and ask for permission to go to the equator. It was the only place that was accessible. Now the good news was that the Spanish king was the French king's uncle. So all Louis had to do was say, dear Uncle Carlos, may my scientists please go to your kingdom where all your gold comes from. Love, your nephew. <laughs> well, in fact, um, this was a big deal for Spain because as I just alluded to, the word Peru meant wealth. If you said it's worth Peru, it meant you had all the money in the world. It was a locked down, closed place. But Spain was starting to enter the Enlightenment as well. And they certainly wanted to get all of the knowledge that France was going to be developing about empire 
and navigation because they had their own empire to deal with. And more to the point, they were becoming allied France and Spain against that perfidious Albion, the, the, the British. So this was also for them a win-win. So this is the first international scientific expedition, which was a big deal. These were the leaders of the expedition. There were more members. About 20 people total um, went on this expedition. They had to sail from Europe, um, across the Isthmus of Panama, and all the way down uh, the, south, the coast of, of Peru. Uh, the leader of the expedition, Louis Godin, uh, most of these portraits were painted many years after they, um, they participated. So they, they were, you know, think about, well, teenagers uh, being on this expedition. Um, Louis Godin had uh, been an astronomer for a few years and probably was the worst person who could have been selected to be the leader. Um, he'd come up with the idea, but he had no experience with leading people. Um, he did not brook any sort of um, uh, criticism. And uh, he saw the expedition as a way to essentially extend his own personal um, interests. So for example, when they were uh, stuck on one of the um, islands in the Caribbean for some months, and he took up with a mistress, which was not that big a deal he, uh, at the time, but spending much of the expedition's fortune on buying her a diamond, that was a big deal. Um, people in the expedition, the younger mem the, the junior members revolted against his, um, against his leadership. In fact, the two gentlemen to the right, Pierre Bouguer and Charles Marie de la Condamine became the de facto leaders of the expedition. Um, Bouguer was a childhood genius. Um, he'd become a professor at the age of 16. Uh, he'd been a professor for some years a brilliant mathematician, but the problem was he had not yet shed that, that title of um, childhood prodigy and, a, and been granted the, um, the title of genius. And this was a way to get him on the map of the French Academy of Sciences. That was the place that you had to be to make it in uh, the French political system, scientific political system. If this doesn't sound all that different from what we see today, it's because in 200 years, the people haven't changed that much. Um, Studious, a bookworm, did not uh, suffer fools gladly. Charles Marie de la Condamine, a few years younger, um, was easily the most interesting person in the entire expedition. Uh, not really a scientist. Uh, he'd fought wars against Spain. He'd uh, come back. He made a fortune by first becoming a friend with Voltaire, whose name you probably know, uh, by cheating the Paris lottery and making the equivalent of several million dollars today. Um, he also made Voltaire rich, so from that point on, they were best friends. Uh, he was well known in, in academic circles and literary circle, circles. Um, the richest man on the expedition, and thank goodness because um, he was smart enough to bring uh, banknotes that uh, enabled the expedition to be saved. Uh, Spain insisted that two naval officers, naval officers, they made certain that even though they were doing land surveys, that these two men, Jorge Juan y Santa Cilia and Antonio de Ulloa, um, were on the expedition very young, in part against uh, the, the p possibility that one of the expedition members would die. Very prescient. Um, so together, they plus their assistants took off on two separate ships in the spring of 1735 and made their way to Peru. Now, it was um, quite a ways to get to Quito, which was the city on the equator at the time, as I said, part of the Viceroyalty of Peru. Um, they had to come from Europe, um, land in Cartagena de Indias. It's a wonderful city if you haven't been, um, one of the most uh, amazingly fortified cities in the world, and we'll get to that in a few minutes, cross over the Isthmus of Panama, and then come down by ship to Guayaquil, and then overland to Quito. Um, this is actually where they conducted their operations. What they were trying to do, as I'll show in the next slide, is survey uh, a what's called a, uh, a, a, or do a triangulation from Quito, right by the equator, to the city of Cuenca, uh, well over 200 miles. And uh, this would take quite an effort. Um, these were scientists whose 
primary job had been uh, in, in um, scientific circles and cla uh, not classrooms, but certainly doing academic studies. They were not unprepared for the physical trials. What they were completely unprepared for were the, uh, the difficulties with politics, the difficulties with entering into a culture that was vastly different from their own. They were, um, if, you, if you want to think about <coughs> colonial Peru in this era, um, it had been perhaps, it was perhaps 100 years in, in culture and thought behind Europe, enlightenment Europe. Very strict, very religious. If you can imagine a 20th century American stepping foot into Victorian Britain, you have some idea of what they were up against. What they had to do physically, though, was do something called triangulation. Now, many of you may remember your geometry classes or even your trigonometry classes, and I'm sorry if I'm causing any sort of post-traumatic stress. <laughs> um, but the idea here, as old as Euclid, is you can measure the, si the, the, the dimensions of a triangle by knowing just one side and two angles. Well, it turns out that if you um, connect triangles in what's called a chain, you can measure one side of one triangle, which is called the baseline. You can then take um, measurements uh, of angles all the way down this distance. Remember, what they're trying to do is determine the length of a degree of latitude. So they have to start at a north end, triangulate to a south end, uh, over a distance of, uh, in this case, three degrees of latitude, which is about 200 miles, roughly from here to New York City. Um, they couldn't. Can I ask you a question? Are you talking about nautical miles or statute miles? In, in this case, I'm talking about nautical miles, but if you want to know, th their unit of measurement was the toise. And the toise was a fathom, which was about six feet. In fact, this expedition was one of the expeditions used to determine what we really should be talking about, which is, of course, meters. But we're not, because this is the United States. So um, about 200 nautical miles. Um, 116,000 toises, I think it was, something like that. Um, so what they're, what they're doing here is um, uh, using, in this case, the vertices of mountains down this chain of the Andes. It was called, uh, uh, they really, these were all volcanoes. You can kind of see a view of those volcanoes there. And they had to set up their sites on, on the summits of all of these mountains, take measurements, and I'll show you the, the instruments that they used, um, down to the south terminal, in this case Cuenca, um, and, and this was, they expected, was going to take them perhaps a couple of years. So actually their plan was um, six months out, two years making the measurements, six months back. Nobody predicted that they would be there over 10 years. Nobody pr would predict that, that some of them would not return for 40 years, and nobody predicted that some of them would return not at all. So the first job was to make a measurement on this baseline. This baseline, which is now covered by an airport, um, which happens a lot to survey baselines. If you've ever flown into Heathrow, that was a survey baseline used to connect the observatories of Paris and London, or Greenwich, in fact. Had to be measured by hand, literally on hands and knees, using sticks of about three toises length, in other words, about 20 feet. Um, over seven miles. Um, that took quite a long time, and this is high up. If you've been in Quito, um, it takes you a long time to acclimate. During this time, um, the expedition, thanks to, in part to Louis Godin, had completely run out of all of its funds. And so Le Condamine had brought with him some banknotes. And these were banknotes that could be exchanged for actual hard cash, which he did by going to Lima, the capital of the Vice Royalty of Peru, and he brought back hard cash. And to me, this is a wonderful side story because it shows just how integrated the global banking system was at that time to be able to bring essentially a, uh, a banknote or a credit card and say, can I, can I take out some cash? And he, he was able to do that. So. This was the, the goal. And they really didn't expect to encounter too many problems. Question? If they're on their hands and knees, literally on the ground, how do they adjust for the elevation changes as they're crawling? They, they do so in a spectacularly wonderful mathematical um, 
uh, uh, fashion, which I would love to talk to you about afterwards. But if you read my book, um, you will see how they did. They actually had to make. <laughs> what was that? Yeah, <laughs> measure of the measure of the earth. Measure of the earth. We'll talk later. Um, but believe me, um, what the, and I'll get the the, the punchline or or really the. Uh, kind of the, the end point of this is just how accurate their final measurement was. I mean, th th this, is, this is the plot spoiler, but they came within just 150 yards, meters, uh, 75 toises, uh, of, of what we measure today. So all the mathematics that they used are really quite advanced. Um, let me show you what they had to do. Because um, to, to get down this triangulation, so I showed you what they had to do on the, on the baseline. That baseline was seven miles over a flat plain. They then had to traverse 200 some odd miles um, by using the peaks of these mountains. And again, these are volcanoes. In fact, one of them over here, it's a little bit outside of, of this, just erupted a few days ago. Um, this volcano, Cotopaxi, which is um, really the most spectacular looking of all the volcanoes, uh, erupts from time to time and erupted while they were there, not while they were on the volcano. A um, lot more snow at the time. Earth's temperature was, was, was much different. Um, but th they had to make these triangulations using this device. That's called a quadrant. And the quadrant at the time, um, today we would use a theodolite, um, was about a 300 pound iron um, device that you could use to make very precise measurements over long distances of, of angles. It stood about as tall as I was, uh, as I am, and 300 pounds. And that had to be taken up these slopes. Now, you know that they did not carry this. Um, in fact, they made extensive use of the Indians who were living there at the time, barely mentioned in all of their accounts, um, the, the people who help them carry out this expedition. And I do talk about that quite a bit in my book because um, it was a, of, of direct interest for the two Spanish officers. I won't say too much in the 40, 45 minutes I have to talk here, but let me be very clear. Those two Spanish officers were the glue that held the expedition together. I mentioned Godin. I mentioned the other leaders. Um, there was a split between the parties, as you probably could imagine, and it was only those two Spanish officers who managed to keep them together. Those two young naval, could, you know, just barely passed uh, midshipmen. Um, so they had to lug these quadrants up and, and uh, take sightings. Now here was one of the things that they did not expect. Uh, this is a very clear uh, day, and that's unusual on the equator, because it turns out it's it's in an area known as the Intertropical Convergence Zone. North and south um, uh, air masses meet, lots of clouds, lots of rain. So what happened was on a day when you could see clearly from one part of the triangle, let's say this volcano to that volcano, that volcano, which you needed to make the angle, was obscured. And then when the other one was clear, the other one was obscured. They would spend, on um, Cotopaxi, I think they spent a month on the summit. Now it's very cold. They had gone to the equator thinking they would be broiling to death, and it turned out they were freezing. And they wrote about this continuously. The, 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 the biggest problem they, they faced was cold, and it was completely unexpected. In fact, most of the things that happened um, to the people on the expedition were not what they had imagined when they made the plans um, in the Academy of Sciences in Paris, which by the way, was in the Louvre. Um, and uh, you can imagine that from the comfort of an armchair in the Louvre, things looked quite easily. It, in fact, turned out to be much different. And this is probably the part of the story that um, is the most astonishing. And the good news was it came right about the middle of the story, which meant that my book could actually, normally, you know, if you read a, a historical accounts, they kind of flag about the middle. And this one, all of a sudden, I had this, this wonderful story. Um, one of the members of the expedition, a surgeon named Senierg, and they brought doctors and surgeons in part for the health, but also um, they wanted to know what kind of plants um, were available in 
Peru, remember the, the people who, the botanists were doctors. That's, that's where all the medicines came from. And if you've heard of quinine, that was the medicine necessary to treat um, malaria. And it came from Peru, but they didn't quite know why it worked sometimes and didn't work other times. So they assigned uh, two, two, two medical men to, to go. Well, Senierg, who was um, one of the surg uh, was the surgeon, um, I mentioned that this was a nation that was about 100 years behind enlightened Europe. And he had a different view of what it meant to um, consort with and court the local women. And he took up um, uh, with a particular woman who was the daughter of a um, prominent person, or sorry, ex-fiance of a very prominent townsman. And the local population did not look on it very well. And he exacerbated the problem in many different ways. Um, my reading of the very violent actions that he undertook um, indicate to me that uh, he may have actually been st coming, uh, starting on the path to schizophrenia. Very hard to diagnose mental illness 300 years away, but I think that's what happened. What that, those incidents um, culminated in was a confrontation between Senierg holding a sword and a pistol against a mass of people who were intent on arresting him and putting him in jail. And he fought back. And as the crowd fought him, um, he ended up losing. They wrenched up stones. This was a bull, this was a bull fight, a celebration that was intended to be um, a, fi a fiesta that turned into, well, the, the bull wasn't the one uh, who was massacred. In fact, the same weapons used to, to attack the bull were used on Senierg. Um, he stumbled out of the bull ring after being stabbed in the side, collapsed in this house over here. It's still there today. This is still here today, not the, not the fight scene. Um, despite ministrations, he died. Um, one of the expedition leaders, Pierre Bouguer, was wounded but was able to recover. It really hampered, of course, the ability of the expedition to carry on. But they, in fact, had, had just completed the triangulation. And although it delayed them, they were able to continue on to um, the next step. Now, notice the date, 1739. They had left in 1735. They're already four years in. They had thought they would be back for a year. This was taking far longer than they expected. And the other problem was that during this time, the British and the Spanish went to war. It was called the War of Jenkins' Ear. Very interesting story there. But here's the bottom line. Um, the British attacked uh, uh, holdings of, of uh, the Spanish all around South America, including uh, Cartagena. Now, the reason why this is uh, interesting is it was Admiral Vernon who attacked Cartagena, certain that he was going to win, so certain that he minted coins uh, showing his victory. Unfortunately, he was up against a one-eyed amputee admiral who was the um, best strategist and most feared admiral on the ocean. And I'm not talking about Nelson. Uh, a generation before Nelson was born, Blas de Leso, and you historian cadets have to look him up as part of your assignment. Blas de Leso was the most feared admiral on the ocean. In fact, he'd be a great thesis topic. Um, L-E-Z-O is his last name. B-L-A-S is his first name. And actually, one of the Spanish destroyers, Aegis destroyers, is named for him. Um, he defeated Vernon, and who had to go back tail between his legs. Now, unfortunately, now, now fortunately um, he still maintained the respect of his officers, one of whom um, had the, uh, uh, you might know his name, uh, I think it was Lawrence. But the last name was, was Washington. And uh, he, he was so impressed with his commanding officer that he named his estate for Admiral Vernon, which of course is Mount Vernon, which he then gave to his brother, half-brother, George Washington. Meantime, Jorge Juan and Ulloa were chasing Admiral Anson around the Pacific because he'd been attacking the West Coast. So that took them away from being able to do what was probably the most important part of this expedition. And that was to measure the length of arc, that is the, um, 
the angular distance from the northernmost to the southernmost points that they had measured on the Earth to get the distance in degrees between those two points. Because when you're trying to measure a degree of latitude, you need the length of arc, in other words, the number of degrees, and the physical distance between the two. You divide one by the other, and you get the length of a degree of latitude. Well, they use this instrument called the zenith sector. You can still see one in uh, Greenwich. And uh, by the way, that picture I showed you of the quadrant, that's in the Royal Observatory in Paris. It's made by the same person who made the original. Um, this was made by a, a British man named Graham. Um, very hard to use, very finicky instrument. Um, every time they would have to readjust it, it could take from a week to a month. Um, so this process of measuring um, the length of a degree of arc, first you take a measurement here, then you take a measurement up there, took them another two and a half years. So by the time 1740 rolls around, they've, they've been in the country for well over five, uh, sorry, 1741, well over five, six years, they were finally able to get the measurement. And it turned out, because they were, um, what they were doing was sighting on this particular star. Um, for those of you who are interested, it's Epsilon Orion. That's the star in the middle of the belt of Orion that actually sits right above the equator. Um, over 270, 227 miles, they measured three degrees, seven minutes. One degree of latitude at the equator, 68.7 miles. That is within 150 yards of what we know today is the length of a degree of latitude at the equator. That's how accurate they, they were able to, to, to make it. Now, when they brought this information back, Bouguer was the first person to come back. Le Condamine um, went down the Amazon. He was one of the first scientists to make the full trip along the Amazon. That's what he became known for. Godin stayed in South America for several years. Um, he really lost face, um, survived two separate earthquakes, one in Lima, 1746, and then the other one which destroyed Cadiz, uh, 1752. Um, but here's what they brought back. They knew that France, uh, in France, the length of a degree of latitude was 69 miles. A separate expedition had gone to the Arctic Circle and back, a little bit longer, and they said shorter. This told them that, in fact, the Earth was, as we know today, flattened at the poles, supported Newton. And the question was, what effect did it have on navigation? Well, it turned out it was fairly small, several tens of miles over a transatlantic voyage. That really wasn't the legacy of this expedition. What it did, you can put in two broad categories. The first is, it opened up the aperture of science from this um, single person, single nation, carrying out small studies to the large international scientific endeavor. In fact, um, this was, as I said, the first international effort to um, do science on a large scale. And it, it, in, it allowed people to think about doing this, for example, um, the transit of Venus expeditions, which were 1765, when Cook uh, along with many other scientists from Italy, from uh, France, from Russia, all carried out observations of Venus. Uh, remember, that was also a, uh, had everything to do with navigation. It was sponsored by the navies, and it was to determine the length of, of, of the distance between the Earth and the Sun. Uh, many other long distance scientific expeditions done internationally were done because of, uh, because of this. There was a famous German scientist named Humboldt, whose name you may have heard, who uh, embarked to South America. And he was very interested in following in their footsteps. Um, Humboldt, of course, opened up this idea of the cosmos. But the person most influenced by Humboldt's expedition was, at the time, a young, wayward uh, botanist, uh, sorry, biologist, uh, who about 30 years later uh, decided to take, to, to ship aboard a vessel that was going around the world. And of course, his name was Charles Darwin. 
So there is a direct link between um, this expedition and Darwin. But more importantly, and, and this is what I say at the very end of my book, um, it opened up the eyes of Europe to South America. Before this, as I said, it was closed. It was where Peru got its money, it was where Spain got its money. Only priests and the occasional um, polemic writer had written about this. Now you had all these scientists come back, and they were writing scientific tech treatises about life there. And, and, and it gave Europeans this idea that this isn't just a, an arm of Spain, this is a land apart, a people apart, a world apart. Now that took a while for it to imprint into the European mindset, but what really happened was it gave the people in South America the same idea. It took a while, but it gave them that same idea. They were not simply part of Spain, they were a people apart. And I say this because Simon Bolivar said it specifically. There's a wonderful biography of him just come out by uh, Marie uh, Arana, which, and you should buy that book after you buy my book and after you buy, um, uh, she writes incredibly, she writes incredibly well, by the way. Just, I wish I could write like her. Um, here's what Bolivar said. Um, I explored the sources of the Amazon and sought to, the ascend, uh, sought to ascend to the pinnacle of the universe. I followed in the footsteps of La Condamine and Humboldt and nothing could hold me back. He said this on another volcano, Chimborazo, just as the two sides, uh, him and San Martin, were coming together to finalize their push to uh, make South America independent from Spain. So there is a direct link from this expedition to Bolivar to the idea of what uh, that nation should be. Now, if, if uh, that, and, and of course, it did not become one nation, but one of the nations that split off from Spain took the name took its name from the expedition itself. You probably already know that Equator in Spanish is Ecuador. And that's why it, uh, Ecuador has its name to this expedition. And what I can tell you is the ambassador of Ecuador um, almost cried when, when he heard that that was the case. He, had, he didn't know that. It's not a very well-known expedition, even in the places that it took that it happened. Part of my goal is to make it, well, perhaps better known. And today, if you go to Ecuador, you can see some traces. There's not much there. First, if you land, this is where the baseline was. Actually, the baseline goes right here, right through that um, taxiway. I was hoping it would go through the terminal because <laughs> I wanted them to paint it, but, but they, they didn't do that. Um, you can see where the expedition stayed in Cayambe. That's a really nice little hacienda. It's old, Guachala. If you go to the observatory, they marked um, part of their expedition with these tablets. Um, this is the only surviving relic. This is what one of the. Um, this is a replica of one of the markers. I mentioned that uh, the plaza where Senier was was assassinated is still there. It's Plaza San Sebastian in Cuenca. Beautiful. And of course, most of you, if you've uh, heard about the middle of the earth, know about this monument placed directly on the equator. Uh, it had nothing to do with the expedition, but it was specifically to commemorate the men, and that's all these statues, who um, had come there to, uh, to measure the earth. So final point, uh, I always like to, to end with this, is the, the fact that these airplanes that are landing and taking off at the Quito airport are doing so because they have GPS, which depend upon an exact knowledge of the, of the size and shape of the Earth. So they're using the technology that began on that very spot. And that means that the, that story has come full circle, as has my lecture, and I'd like to take questions. <laughs> Sir. Started the book. Did you know that was the conclusion you were headed towards? This change in South America, or you just no? I absolutely did not. I actually started because one of the things that happened during this expedition, thank you, was that this book, which is called Treatise of the Ship, and I want the uh, camera to get that. So you see this big thick book. This was written by Pierre Bouguer while he was on this expedition. This is the first treatise of naval architecture. <laughs> 
That's right. He wrote the very first scientific work of naval architecture while he was hundreds of miles away from the ocean, thousands, uh, thousands of feet up in the air. Um, and this was one of the more astonishing feats. And I actually was, was working on the history of naval architecture, um, as was alluded to, when I discovered this expedition. This was about 20 years ago. And the story of the expedition just grabbed me. And I, it would, just wouldn't let me go. And so after I finished this, I vowed I'm not going to tackle this subject. It's too hard. I couldn't let it go. And so I started on that path. And that's what I found, is that, in fact, um, it was more, much more about how it opened the eyes of Europe to what South America um, really was than anything. Now, full disclosure, my wife is Peruvian. So I had some personal interest in the story. But that, that, that only helped when I was um, trying to decipher 18th century Spanish handwritten manuscripts. And my Spanish was pretty good, but not, not, I, I needed her help for that. And even then, she got flummoxed sometimes. Yes, sir? What was going on with some of the other indigenous cultures in like Brazil or Portugal or other colonization countries that ultimately split up and divided South America? Right? The, uh, ever since the, uh, the European uh, nations had, had pretty much divided up South America into two big places, there was Brazil, Portugal, and then, of course, everything else was Spain. Um, they, there had been uh, this distinction b between the, lower, the lowest class, the middle, and the upper class. And now the three peoples were the whites, in other words, the Spanish, the blacks, the slaves, and the Indians. Now, if you, uh, in a kind of a reflexive uh, thought, believe that perhaps the slave population was the lowest class, you'd be wrong. In fact, the Indians were considered quite a bit lower. And, and there were times when uh, African slaves would, would assign their work to the uh, Indian population. Uh, that kind of gives you an idea of just how bad it had gotten. And every decade or so, there was an uprising. There was a revolt. Um, what I found somewhat surprising was um, how close, in, in some cases, the population had come to really being able to throw off uh, Spain's yoke. Now, this was surprising to me because uh, it turned out one of the biggest revolts happened many years later uh, by Tupac Amaru. And it happened just at the, as the Battle of Yorktown was starting to take place. Now, Yorktown, as you all know, um, was a French-American effort. But in fact, Spain had been part of that um, in our eyes quite in the background, but it wasn't, it was only because of Spain that France was able to engage in the first place. But Spain was very worried about supporting America because they had their own uprisings and they didn't want to have that example of a, uh, you know, the, 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 coloni uh, the colonists uh, revolting against the king. So in, in Mexico, in um, uh, Venezuela, many of these places you had a, a series of uprisings. It wasn't until, uh, really until the Napoleonic Wars and several other factors outside of their control took place that, the, uh, that South America was finally able to become independent. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Sir? Yeah, some years ago, I saw one of the stone markers that represents the corner of the quadrants of Washington, D.C. Or yeah, the, they're called piers, which look the like piers. this. Well, that's my point. That's what I'm asking is, that's like the size of a few feet. That's huge. That was that's a building. That was why so big. Well, that was Le Condamine's effort to um, show, and, and uh, all of you who are in military understand that presence is power. And when you can leave a marker behind that said, France was here, because actually the top of this the, these t stone tablets essentially said, paraphrasing, the French king um, commanded this be done, and there's our fleur de lis up on the top. France was here. So that's, that's like 20 feet high. It's, it's about, uh, about 30 feet on a side and about 20 feet high. So very much it was a military, um, uh, it, it was a military gesture. And it caused innumerable pro problems. Five minutes. Um, 
innumerable problems for, uh, for, for the expedition. To build? To, be, well, they were gonna, the Spanish were gonna tear it down. Um, <laughs> so, but again, I'd be happy to talk about it a little bit. I just wanna make sure I get through. Isn't there anywhere easier they could have gone than Peru, like Egypt or something? They needed some place on the equator. Remember, this is France, and if you know anything about the French people, it has to be precise. So you need, if you're gonna be on the equator, there were three sites. There was, um, they didn't own Brazil, so they couldn't do it in, in Brazil. And besides, um, a lot of jungle there. Um, Africa, but there were some slaving uh, ports along the African coast, but nothing that they could really make use of. Certainly they, they, they had no, uh, they, you needed essentially an army to, to maintain the, the uh, peace. And Indonesia, but not many ships went to Indonesia. It was still fairly, not backwater, but certainly Fran France didn't go there. So this was the best of all possible worlds, and it only became possible when there was a formal agreement between France and Spain. In fact, um, it was the very first um, cooperative effort once this treaty it was called the Bourbon, the, the treaty, uh, the Bourbon Family Compact uh, was signed. It was signed in November, and within three months, um, that, uh, that expedition was, was on, the, on the way. But you don't have to be right in the credit if you're 10 degrees off, as long as you know where you are. Um, they wanted to be right at the equator. Um, there's a whole, I have several uh, uh, manuscript examples of, of their goal to be right at the equator. Again, they, they wanted to be very precise. I'm curious about how measurement error would affect the final conclusions of the prolate versus oblate. What would the measurements have been if it had actually supported Descartes' theory? Um, well, it would have shown, uh, actually me uh, measurement inaccuracies started the whole thing. They, during the original survey of France, they had made some errors in measurement uh, because of the, the, the accuracy of the instruments. One of the problems is this instrument, the Zenith Sector, was so accurate that they started to see discrepancies which were, called by, uh, uh, um, which were caused by an astronomical phenomenon um, called stellar aberration, which I really, uh, I, I would love to go into in detail, but that had never been seen or, sorry, had not been seen previously because the instruments were not as accurate. But when you get to the level of accuracy that they were dealing with, about um, a couple of seconds of arc, um, you start to see motions of stars, motions of the planet that hadn't affected previous measurements. So they spent, a, they spent at least a year trying to figure out where these discrepancies were com coming from. So it was a big effort and it was a big deal. Take one more quick question and then we've got to get the mids up to their class. <laughs> or anybody else up to lunch. Okay, last question. Last question. Uh, do they have to sort of live off the land, given that they were there for these, uh, a decade or more? How did they provision or resupply or continue to exist? One of the reasons that they chose this site is because you had, um, you had a major city, sorry, over here. A major city at one end, a major city at the other end, another major city in the middle. So um, one of the things they thought about was exactly that. They had the money, before Godin wasted it, um, to be able to buy supplies, food, and one of the ways that they were able to carry out the expedition is all those Indians that I had mentioned, and by the way, since they call themselves Indian, that's the term I use, just so you understand, um, were just the way we were doing expeditions up through the 20th century families would accompany them and, and they would go ahead and they would um, set up camp and they would cook their meals um, and, and carry all of their equipment and goods. So that few uh, people that I talked about probably were surrounded by a train of maybe 30 or 40 additional people and everybody wore the same clothes. They all wore these, these ponchos and drab clothes so you wouldn't be able to tell one from the other if you saw that expedition going down the road. They would have, everybody looked the same. Actually to the point where, and this I found very interesting, they were all about the same height. We all think of, of people from the Andes as being very small, which they are, but Europeans at the time were only about 5'3". So there was, they were actually um, all about the same height. So they were, it was almost indistinguishable, and that's what allowed that expedition to happen. All right, thank you so much, we appreciate it. You're welcome.
12 coming up, we have two more. Next Wednesday, Craig Simons returns, and we'll discuss the, the Navy during the Civil War. The following Wednesday, Dr. Gene Smith will discuss uh, slavery and the Navy during the War of 1812. So spread the word. Thanks.